So I'd like to welcome everyone to our info session for eBrain services and for sensitive data call. I'm Refia Durmas from Technical University of Munich, HPP Calls Management Team, and I would like to also introduce the speakers um, today. Professor Jan Biali, HPP Infrastructure Operations Director, uh, Stephen Vermulen, Chief Infrastructure and Information Officer, eBrains. So I would like to shortly give the word to Jan to also say welcome to our participants. Thank you, Refia. It's a pleasure to to meet with you today. We uh, look forward to having your questions and we'll give a uh, summary of the call and some background information that we believe will be relevant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Steven, would you like to also say welcome to our participants? Definitely say uh, welcome. Uh, welcome to everybody and looking forward to your questions and also to your uh, responses to the call. Yeah, thank you very much for joining uh, today's session. Uh, so, I would like to go through the agenda of today's um, session. First five minutes will spare for the welcome and explanation of procedures about this session. And then for the next five minutes, I will be presenting the application procedure and then we'll be responding your questions for the next five minutes about application procedure or budget uh, or in general application platform. And then for the next half an hour, um, Stephen and Jan will be presenting the introduction to eBrains, the context and scope of the call, expectations and technical background about this call. And then we'll have 35 minutes for your questions. So the aim of this session is to introduce the application procedure and the timeline and to explain the topic of the call, to give more details, what is especially relevant for the call and provide additional insights about the match of the potential proposals to the aims of the HPP and eBrains. So during the session, while we are presenting, if you have any questions, please type your questions into Q&A box down the screen, you can see that. Uh, and we can cover them when it's time for questions. And yeah, if towards the end of the meeting, if we have time, I would like to also give you the word to, to ask your questions verbally. Maybe that is more efficient. So there is a hand gesture down uh, there on your screen. So you can click on that and we can give you the word uh, to ask your question verbally. But I would like to remind that this session is being recorded and will be shared publicly. Um, so be careful while sharing your ideas or details about your proposal because the participants of this call are the potential applicants of this call as well. So if after the meeting you will have still more questions or more details to be covered, you can always contact us at info at opencalls.humanbrainproject.eu. So the application timeline, we opened this call on 7th of April and today is one month already that the call is open. So a pre-final deadline for submission of your draft proposal is 17th of May until 5 p.m. Brussels time. So this is very important to receive your draft submission to avoid any technical problem that you can be facing during the last hours of, of the final deadline, which is 20th of May. So when you submit your draft proposal, and maybe your draft budget table and in general application, you do not need to replace anything afterwards. You can upload as many proposals as you wish and only your most recent upload will be considered for evaluation. And you can also update your budget table or partner data on the application platform until the last minute, which is 17th of May, 5 p.m. So I would like to remind that failure of any timely submission of the proposal for any reason, including communication delays, will automatically lead to rejection of your proposal. So if you have any technical problem, we'll be ready to support you until the deadline. However, after the call is closed, we can't help you. So um, regarding the application procedure, we had the first contact phase where you shared your uh, proposal ideas to check with our HPP scientists if, if your proposal is um, feasible or relevant for this call. Uh, if you haven't sent an email about your proposal idea, please send them to info at opencalls.humanbrainproject.eu or the email address that we provided in the guide for applicants. So I would like to remind that your proposals have to strictly adhere to the template we provided 
uh, on open call platform, which will share the link again once more. So you can reach to all um, call documents as well as the call template, uh, the proposal template, uh, which we expect you to use. So in the proposal template, you will see a length a maximum page limit for overall proposal as well as each section. So if you do not respect this page limit that is presented in the proposal template per section, your access pages will be removed before evaluation. Um, so also uh, one more detail that I would like to mention that I see most of the applicants uh, are having difficulty with is that the budget table will appear right after you insert your partner data. And then you need to select the cost model, which is HPP SJ3, and you have only one cost model, so you will just select that. And the problem is there are so many sections, and you might not have all the final numbers when you are first when you are doing your first submission. So please feel free to insert zero to every section um, as a draft in your budget table. Uh, and please remember that there are also subsections. You need to put a number there, even if it's a draft, in order to be able to submit, because those sections are required for, for even first submission, uh, because we don't want you to forget those um, important se uh, sections to be filled. Uh, therefore, yeah, please remember to put zero into every subsection in your budget table. So after you submit, your proposal or anytime you edit it, you will receive a confirmation email. So if you don't receive a confirmation email about your application, it means you couldn't submit and uh, you can contact us if you need help with that. So regarding the eligibility criteria of this call, both non-HPP partners and HPP partners can apply to this call. Um, however, HPP partners can only request up to 20% of the total call budget while it, non-HPP partners can request 80% or more of the total call budget. So what do I mean by non-HPP partners and HPP partners? So non-HPP partners are not part of the HPP consortium and not receiving any funding from HPP SGA3, while the HPP partners are part of HPP consortium and they are receiving funding from HPP SGA3. However, if your institution is part of HPP, but your unit is not part of HPP, your lab, your department, or your unit is not part of HPP, you can apply also as a non-HPP partner and request 80% uh, or more of this call budget. And I would like to also mention that the organizations that are currently under contract with HPP partners for the supply of product and services, that are paid by SGA3 funds are not eligible for this call and not therefore not eligible for funding. So, and the European Commission's eligibility and financial rules apply. The new partner organizations must be uh, in the EU member states or Horizon 2020 associated countries. So please make sure that you check if you're eligible. And yeah, these are basically um, the eligibility criteria that we have, but please also read the guide for applicants for more details and to reach the links about all these details. And now I would like to also cover the proposal budget. So the total call budget for this um, call is 1 million euro and we will have one proposal selected. So the maximum budget per proposal is 1 million euros. And um, as I've said, 80% of the proposal can go to non hp partner while not more than 20% uh, of the proposal uh, should go to non uh, to, to HPP partner so and also we request 20 uh, 200 uh, k co-funding from you however please not include this into your online budget table online budget table is only reflecting the budget requested from our side and co-funding can be mentioned in the pre-proposal template and you will see the relevant section. So here is a sample budget that I would like to present. Numbers can change, of course, according to your calculations. So HPP externals, uh, external budget can be 800K or more and internal budget cannot be more than 200K. So this is the maximum that you can assign to your HPP partner and the total you will see that will be 1 million. And then after you insert these numbers, you will realize that the platform will automatically add 25% indirect cost to your budget table. And you will see that your total sum will be 1,250,000 euros 
and cannot be more than this. So these are the basic details that I wanted to cover. And then you can have access to all this information in your guide for applicants. And also we have added a checklist for self-evaluation um, into your application uh, page so that you can see if you meet all of this criteria that I've presented here. So any questions? Thank you very much for your attention. And then now, if you have any questions about application procedure, the call budget, or the eligibility, I'm happy to answer. So just to save the time of our session, uh, I, won't, I won't wait. Mm, yes. For the moment, I don't see any, any questions. Therefore, I won't wait more. And I would suggest we switch into the next presentation. And if you have still questions about application, please uh, write them down and we can cover at the end of the session. So Jan, would you like to uh, start with the presentation of next part? Yeah, thank you again. Yeah, thank you. So we will divide this presentation into two parts and I will begin with the context and scope of the open call. Okay, good. A little bit slow reaction, but here we are. So the first slide shows just a few key points about the Human Brain Project. Um, we recommend that you uh, walk through the different pages on humanbrainprojects.eu if you are not familiar with this project to see the broader picture. So the first bullet point is basically the history. Uh, the second bullet point is something about what the project does at this point in time. Um, uh, also in the last phase, which started in April 2020 and will end in March 2023 that will also be the end date for um, your participation if you are awarded uh, a grant. So the focus of HBP in this last phase uh, are on different scientific areas that are listed here, brain networks, their role in consciousness and artificial neural nets. And the other role of HBP in this phase is to continue to expand what we refer to as the eBrain's research infrastructure. And this research infrastructure will remain available. And for this reason, also the new coordinator of the Human Brain Project is a nonprofit, eBrains ASPL, based in Brussels, Belgium. So, what is the eBrains RI? What's its ambition? To accelerate the effort to understand human brain function and disease by fostering collaborative brain science and of course help secure a leading position um, for this field in Europe. So this is a new distributed digital research infrastructure for brain and brain inspired research, providing tools and services, assisting scientists in their research in collecting data, analyzing, sharing, integrating data from the brain and performing modeling and simulation of brain function. So HBP is responsible now for developing the eBrains research infrastructure. Um, and this eBrains web portal was launched um, in the fall of 2019. HBP will continue to develop tools and services and populate the research infrastructure until its end in 2023. The AISPL, a nonprofit based in, in Brussels, Belgium, will, has actually now taken over as coordinator and uh, will also be the central hub in future eBrains operations in Europe. And the portal, of course, is available at eBrains.eu. So 
it's important to see the difference between what you can find on the Human Brain Project website, where there is information about the project, and a lot of things in preparation also for the eBrains research infrastructure. Whereas if you go to the eBrains web portal and go through the different tools and services provided by the infrastructure, they are all for researchers in principle external to HPP. So there is nothing there which can only be used by HPP participants. And these services fall broadly in three categories. The services that are open to a broad community, that's one mentioned here on finding data models and software, and there are several, many of them and of also the general support. Then there are the access control services where there is a need for an eBrains account, but many can have such an account, so it's very inclusive. And then there would be services that are of a limited nature. For example, if there is a need for a deeper support or some access to computing services, there might be restrictions, and this could be a priority to institutions that are more closely associated with eBrains. So the services we have at this point in time, first quarter of 2021, it looks like the following. I'm not going to, of course, go through and explain all of this. It's pretty easy to navigate. I, we hope the um, uh, web portal in this regard. So it covers everything from uh, data knowledge part, uh, atlases, brain atlases, a little bit comparable to um, various types of maps of the earth in the geography field. We have similar needs. Um, but the, the maps of the brain are three-dimensional, so the atlases are quite complicated. Uh, simulations of brain function, brain-inspired technologies, neurobotics, neuromorphic computing, medical data analytics at the moment, the medical informatics platform, there will be more in this one soon, and also various community aspects. So for uh, uh, to address uh, topics of interest for this call, it's uh, for this talk, it's obviously the data knowledge topic that we will move into. So on the eBrands web portal, there is the opportunity to look at the available services. And if choosing the data and knowledge, uh, one would find one service for sharing data models and software, addressing a broad community that can request this sharing, and the service for finding the data models and software that are in the system. So the shared service is built around the eBrains knowledge graph, which is an unlimited graph, quote from the call text actually, the guide, an unlimited graph allowing infinite expansion of the metadata and the linking uh, of the different elements. So the key characteristics, it uh, originates from HPP research, but it's now targeting broader brain research community. So we have a lot of incoming requests for curational data and data from external participants, and this is going to be a community um, uh, service. It is very horizontal, meaning that it accepts heterogeneous data and file formats in contrast to several other services that are either completely generic, which has no neuroscience perspective to them, or targeting a specific domain area, a field inside neuroscience. We, we, we are broad in this regard, but we are neuro, neurocentric. So uh, for this reason, it's easy for the data provider, neuroscientists and others working in the domain of neuro-inspired research to contribute the data. This is a low threshold to enter. Uh, of course, the challenge then is that there are many data modalities and a broad collection of content. And that of course leads to various needs for recommendations for standardization. Open access and opportunities for reuse is the basic principle behind, behind this service. And it's presented on, on service pages on, on the web where these things are explained. With the curation request forms, uh, specific channels for journal authors, how they can combine the publication of data and journal articles, and details uh, are available in different formats. This is just, of course, all on the web portal. So the Find Data Service, that is a service which allows access to various collections of data. And uh, there is a graphical user interface that one can use to enter keywords or to use the available filters, have search results, 
choose these results and move into the data that you can find in this way. So that whole system brings together highly diverse content and formats, sorts all of this and connect it, connects the, the different pieces through the knowledge graph that uses certain metadata schemas that we are also developing uh, in order to have something that meets uh, the needs in, in the field of neuroscience and brain research in general. So on those data cards, when the data have been found, discovered, it will be possible, or it is possible at this point, to, to launch uh, specific applications uh, or go out to different environments for further analysis of the data, uh, including uh, main routes for analysis being Knowledge Graph API and also Jupyter Hub. So now moving out of this entirely publicly available part into the next stage. We are not yet at the SSD, uh, Service for Sensitive Data, but now we're getting closer. eBrains is introducing access to strongly pseudonymized human data. We refer to it as the Human Data Gateway, developed, developed by our teams in uh, what we call the Data Knowledge Services and the Computing Services. Now, this is a system which uses what we just looked at, but it has a controlled access. So it means that you have to have an eBrains account, and that is not enough because you have to uh, adhere to certain policies and confirm that you accept a set of conditions. If you do that, you have a time-restrained and logged access. So the users are traced, logged, then they can ac have access to uh, strongly pseudonymized human data. Note, of course, that only data that have been specifically targeted for this, services, this service are in the system, meaning that the data protection officers and the data provider will have to check that this is a type of data that's suitable for this type of sharing. But as you can see, this, of course, doesn't cover everything we need. So for this reason, we have the call. And that is to introduce access to a full spectrum of human brain data. And that requires quite a number of measures, which we have outlined in the call. So what is this full spectrum of human brain data? Uh, I always find this uh, future of privacy forum visual guide quite informative. Uh, this is a modified and simplified version of what they have produced. And at the top, we have kind of our position in this landscape. So it shows uh, uh, direct identifiers to the left, indirect identifiers and safeguards and controls. And it shows some terms like explicitly personal, not readily identifiable, key coded, etc. And as you will see in a moment, we have to translate these terms. They are quite broad international, not specifically European and um, are not easy to interpret. So we will redo this figure in a moment, but just what do we have? The HPP knowledge graph, which has been around for some time, covers for human data the anonymized data. With the human data gateway, just the previous slide, we can cover some of those data that are not entirely anonymized, but are close to strongly pseudonymized. Now we also want to go to the left with the service for sensitive data. So that brings us to a slide which is important in this regard. The upper row, raw pseudonymous anonymous, that's kind of referring to GDPR terminology. The row below, personal, key coded, the identified and so on, refers to terms that are commonly used but not typically European. And below you have some symbols indicating what does it mean for direct identifiers, indirect identifiers, and re-identification probabilities. So of course, um, the key point here might be the indirect identifiers. And uh, you may note the little fingerprint that we have placed in the head of this figure. So while the figure is kind of gradually being blurred as you go from left to right in the middle row on indirect identifiers, um, there can be fingerprint type of information that still is there. Whether such data can be shared in a, through our human data gateway or not, that depends on a number of the other metadata available. 
So there has to be a concrete evaluation whether that's possible or not. Of course, in general, you can really not deal with most of the data on the left side other than through a service for sensitive data. This is what we want to add to the eBrain services, covering at least what's inside that circle. And of course, possibly a little bit more to the right as well. And that is what the entire call is essentially about. And we have tried to specify all the different requirements for this. And um, we will then now continue with some comments on uh, the call text. So I think I'll just go straight to Stephen from there. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll take you through a couple of, um, I'll shut down my phone, um, uh, expectations and the technical background. Yeah, next slide, yes. So um, what we expect for this uh, SSD call, um, and it should be part of, uh, of the research infrastructure platform. Um, and that means it needs to serve the research consortia in Europe. So that's the multi, it's by definition multinational. And we are looking for support in basic, but also clinical and translational research. Um, we're looking for delivering services and tools that um, work across the countries um, and work, of course, with sensitive data, as just explained uh, by Jan. So that's that's key importance. And so we want to extend our service into that sensitive data space. Um, and that means in, that means that all of the other aspects of the platform uh, need to be supported as well, collaborative sharing, collecting and analyzing. Um, on top of that, um, we want this um, solution to link into the platform, into the other services that are available on the platform, and that's specifically then the data and knowledge services to allow um, sharing of results not of course of the data because um, by definition we are talking about sensitive data so we're not going to public share that um, and that needs to be taken into account as well um, and of course i mean we are talking about sensitive data so uh, gdpr compliance um, and also showing how it will be gdpr compliant is quite important um, and we like this to be based well we like this we, it, it, it's a requirement that it should be based on an existing service uh, so we're not going to reinvent the wheel here. We want an existing service um, that then, of course, um, needs to be adapted and to be integrated into our system. And we need that described how that's going to be done. Uh, that's, uh, that's a key requirement. Um, you will find in the call also that the requirements have been divided into four groups. So we have the infrastructure requirements. I'll go a bit in detail on the next slide on that. We have process and regulatory requirements. Um, in case of software solutions, um, we also have some additional requirements on how the software um, needs to integrate. And then there's a few optional requirements as well. Um, quite important uh, to lift out of the proposal of the call text as well is that we expect to have one use case um, for the proposed system uh, that demonstrates how um, this can be used in research or uh, to, to achieve a certain goal. So that's quite important that that um, a proof point is also there. Jan, can I have the next slide? Okay, so um, this is a high level view of the main components of the eBrains uh, solution, specifically focusing on the data side. So I already talked about the knowledge graph, let's say that's the entry point where you find data and where um, the data is um, eventually shared as well. Um, so that's that's the entry point. Um, and of course, this solution needs to be aware of that and needs to link into that such that this data is also findable with respect to the sensitive nature of that data. Um, all the way to the left um, is basically that, of course, we have an authentication and authorization infrastructure um, that is uh, key to the whole platform and also needs to be used here. And this needs to then take into account also the, the fact that we have need authorization for this and sensitive data. Um, on the right side, uh, if I go through this uh, picture to the right, uh, you find the data gateway, which was already explained by Jan. This is basically controlling the access to the data. 
So for open data, there's of course not a lot of uh, access requirements uh, to be managed, but as, long, uh, as we move into that picture that Jan was showing to the left side, um, here going through strongly anonymized R2 um, secure or sensitive data, um, that's, it's important that the identification and the access is locked and, uh, and tracked. So that's, um, that's the data gateway. And then you have the different data sources um, combined with computing resources that uh, we currently support and the one that we uh, want to uh, add to the system for sensitive data. Um, in the bottom, you also see that we um, uh, foresee also that there are um, potential extensions to um, the authentication uh, structure um, to take into account this notion of sensitive data as well. If that's the case or if that's required, uh, then we uh, would like to be that, that so to see that stipulated in the, uh, in the answers. Um, Couple of other points that I um, maybe mentioned, well, quite important for us uh, because we are working typically with large data sets um, is the co-location of uh, data with computing resources. Um, if that's not the case, then we have a way of moving that data around, but it's basically in principle, the code that will visit the data and not the other way around. Um, and uh, of course, uh, quite important to note also that we expect that, um, well, it should be known to you if you want to answer this call, but uh, we expect that uh, the sensitive data is, of course, encrypted both at rest and in transport. So that, um, I think, are the main highlights of what um, uh, what is there from a technical architecture and what you need to integrate into. I think that's, yeah, that's it. So we're now open to questions, I guess. I would like to thank you very much, Jan and Stevan, for this uh, presentation and um, providing all these details. And I would like to remind our participants that uh, you can ask for questions. You can post them also anonymously in, in our question box. Um, so this can be a very good chance uh, to ask our questions to also our scientists if you are planning to apply to this call. Uh, so far, we have received one question about uh, the consortium. So I would like to read the question and answer for um, all the participants to also listen. When applying as a consortium, what are the requirements for a collection of organizations to be considered as a consortium? So uh, you do not have to uh, apply with many partners. You can also apply alone as one institution or come together with other institutions and apply as a consortium. So. Um, the main requirement would be to be eligible for funding, um, meeting those eligibility criteria that presented, and that uh, your internal partner um, should not request more than 20% of the budget, uh, which means you cannot apply if you're only an internal partner. So external par partners can also apply as a single institution. So if you'd like to also ask your questions verbally, you can click on the raise hand icon so that uh, we can give you a chance to speak up. So I will just give um, a minute until uh, to wait if you receive any questions. So one question we received, I would like to um, answer. I would like to in uh, inquire if there is a call for building infra for institutions that do not yet have the technical expertise or capacity to participate in researches by HPP. Um, so we have for the moment only this call open, uh, but uh, I would like to ask also if Jan and Stephen would like to comment to this question. Uh, yes, we, we might need some more information to, to understand the question, but but just to emphasize that this is about a service that can support research in the domain of brain research neuroscience broadly. It's not about supporting specifically HPP research. And actually the system of course is expected to be available as a minimal viable product towards the end of 2022 and has to be finished before the end of the HPP project period, which uh, ends on, at the end of March 2023. And that's where this is going to be useful at the European level 
of course, for HPP researchers, but for many more. So I don't know if that kind of answers the, the, the question. Yeah, thank you very much. So I would like to read another question. Um, the storage capacity for data storage in general does not need to be made available by the applicants. Available HPP resources are planned to cover this aspect, correct? So Jan, would you like to comment? Um, well, that's a good question. And I think we need to go a bit back and forth on it. Would you like to start on that one, Stephen? Because it speaks to the post HPP phase primarily that's when this system is going to have its full impact yeah so i think storage is uh, is important and um uh, as said there are several requirements towards storage when storing sensitive data so it's not just um any um uh, we cannot just say okay let's take we, we take care of that so in the case of a software solution we expect that the software solution is able to handle that um and take care of that on an existing um, data store, for instance. So that means probably handling encryption and those kind of things. Um, in case of a, um, uh, a black box solution, let's call it like that, um, then um, the storage should be included because uh, there's no way we can provide the security requirements uh, on top of that. That's exactly why we do the, uh, why we do this call. So storage capacity has to be included in that case. Yes. That's at least my view. And that's how I've understood the question. Thank you very much. I hope this clarifies. Um, not please um, feel free to ask follow-up questions. So I would like to just give a couple of more seconds uh, space and so that if our participants have further questions, they can also post. So I'd like to read the next question. Is there any level of curation or data quality requirements by the platform? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question because uh, any useful platform will have to think through that. So uh, curation of data is in place for the existing systems. A new system which works within quite different conditions, uh, cannot have a curation necessarily from the curation teams we have for the other parts of the system. So it will have to look at what's been available from uh, the Emerence data knowledge system. There, for example, we have the new metadata schemas being established. So the adoption of these is a relevance, but the individual projects that will be using the service in the future I mean, this will rely on, for example, European consortium being set up and saying they will use this service. They will have to, in their data management plans, obviously, like all projects, explain how they will deal with their data, including curation. They will then be able to tap into what's available from eBrain's data knowledge services, but we cannot upfront say how that would work for any consortium in the future for sensitive data. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to read the following question. Do we have an idea of what the expected size of required storage capacity would be? So Jan or Steven? Uh, yeah, there are several like ways to answering. I could try one, one way of answering and maybe Steven has another way. Well, I mean, if we look into the future, you have a system and then you have concrete projects, typically European level projects, several partners that go together. And, and the intention is that they can work more efficiently with an international or cross boundary system, which is what, what we want to have for brain research. They will have to specify what, what they need and what, what kind of storage capacities would be needed for these projects. So um, it's, uh, it can be dealt with in many different ways, as we all know. 
data can be shared at a very comprehensive level and there can be some other levels that are shared. Um, so I would not like to give a precise number on this, um, but I'm sure it can be looked at from different angles. Do you have a further comment, Steven? Uh, no, clearly we, we, we're not going to put a number here because either that's going to be too high or too low. Um, it's the data that will drive uh, the capacity needs. Um, so we're looking for the solution and the solution needs to be scalable to um, a certain extent, of course. Uh, but uh, I guess all limitations, both up and down, um, should be stipulated in your answers um, so that we know what we are working with uh, and what, uh, what the scaling cap cap capabilities of the solution are. Um, and then it's going to be driven by uh, um, actual requirements uh, from the data. Uh, one thing to note is that we um, do also look at long-term storage. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not typically something that is uh, short-lived. Uh, we are looking at uh, potentially longer-term storage and that's over several years uh, because there might be references to it or ongoing research to that data. Thank you very much. So one participant would like to ask uh, his question verbally. So I'd like to give uh, the word to Emra. Yeah, we are listening to you, Emra. Um, hello, Rafa. can you guys hear me? Yeah, we do. So it, it's not really a question, but it's uh, maybe a comment. And Jan, Steven, please uh, feel free to substantiate or interrupt. But so I, I understand from um, the the purpose of the call is uh, uh, to also be uh, adaptive uh, compliant for different territories and different geographies. So um, the storage will most likely be uh, required to uh, provide some federation capabilities and uh, span across multiple countries. Um, and for each storage capability, then there is the compute uh, that comes with it for sort of sandboxing the processing of the data. Uh, by that, I mean that the data is not also just stored, but uh, it has to be uh, usable uh, in a secure manner uh, through the different tools and software suites that will be made available for the data. Uh, those would be most like a domain specific, but maybe to give you an, uh, an order of, um, of uh, size as to the, the data capacities that would be required. Uh, one of our um, well, the, the co-product uh, owner of the human interest cerebral uh, EEG database platform called the HIP uh, in the service category five of the work package four in the human brain project that was very long, but <laughs> is uh, Olivier David who has uh, built this uh, uh, collection of data called F-Tract and that's uh, close to 50 terabytes of, uh, of data. So data and that's the spectrum of, uh, of activity can get pretty heavy and uh, we're talking about long-term storage we're talking about backup storage as well and we're talking about uh, security on top of that what i believe should be reasonable to ask from the participants of this call is to provide at least the proof of concept and the prototype of how the storage and the compute would work together and provide the security aspects required and obviously as the service categories will require uh, to use uh, the, the storage, uh, we would have to extend or find ways to uh, contribute or uh, pay for the storage uh, post 2023. And, uh, I'll leave it back up to you and uh, you can, I'll lower my hand. Yeah, thank you for sharing your comments. I would like to ask the panelists if they would like to comment on this. I think it's a useful comment from Emra, but I'm not sure I have anything to add. But just um, maybe uh, clarifying a bit, um, Emra talked about uh, federation. Um, that's an important aspect. Um, but it can be done in, mul in multiple ways, but it's an important aspect to be compliant um, across Europe, um, could be done by um, centrally storing it uh, and providing access from the different countries, or it could be done by federated, uh, um, we're willing to look at both uh, types of uh, solutions, uh, although federated uh, is of course a uh, preference. This might indeed be a key point because, well, 
we cannot for sure say we are not doing this, but uh, we are under the impression that there are services that can work quite well at the national level and um, maybe do something internationally, but this is really the, the key point here. This is typically to address the, um, the, the legislations, for example, for France, which requires for all um, sensitive data hosting providers to be uh, uh, they have to, to be legitimate and certified, uh, called hébergement de santé, I believe. Um, and so they, they tend to be the most restrictive in Europe in terms of uh, sensitive data hosting, especially when it comes to medical data. And that's why I think that the federation aspect is uh, predominant here, because then you can be compliant per territory or per nation, um, also containing processing, but that overall uh, access of data is, uh, is possible and uh, can be on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis granted uh, at a multinational level. Yeah, thank you for your further comments. And yeah, if there are no further comments from our panelists, I would like to read the next question. How do the cu current HPP HPC centers figure in this storage requirement, especially interesting in respect of long-term storage and backup. Would you like me to re read the question again, or would you like to respond? I, I, I think the question uh, was clear. Um, the current existing um, HPC centers do have storage and that's what uh, was featured. Um, so this is currently storing the open data, but as mentioned, um, that's part of our solution. And if a solution uh, is provided that we can store sensitive data in those same centers, then that is an acceptable solution. So they feature in this and that also can provide with the necessary security requirements over it. Um, as long as of course those um, computing centers are also um, willing to do that uh, because there are some liabilities uh, attached to that. Um, but in that sense, we, 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 we look at uh, any possible solution that um, incorporates the existing storage um, and upgrades it to sensitive uh, storage or um, adds to that. Uh, but taking into account, I think Emre was correct uh, in, his, uh, in his statement there. It's not always, it's not possible to um, cross with sensitive data many borders. Um, that's uh, something we know in Europe that is a limitation and that you have to be aware of when answering this call. Thank you very much for your uh, reply. So this was um, the last question in, in the Q&A box. Um, if there are further questions, please feel free to ask until we close the session. Um, so. At the moment, I would like to ask uh, Jan to, uh, to share his uh, final comments before we uh, close this call about what we expect uh, from our applicants or maybe in general about the call. Yes, well, I'm happy to, to give one kind of concluding uh, remark. Uh, I suppose uh, with all proposals, it's uh, of course important to study every little detail in the call documents, obviously. Uh, it's also important to think that what you need to do is to convince uh, the reviewers and not to be thinking too much about what do they want. You need to convince them. We hope we have um, uh, made it clear what the intentions are and that you can make a useful interpretation of that. And uh, we really look forward to seeing um, what will be coming into this very, very important initiative. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Stephen, would you like to also um, share your last words before we uh, close the session? Well, I've not, uh, not much to add. I think Jan was very clear on that. Uh, so um, try to uh, bring a convincing solution um, that can help us forward in this uh, quite important uh, aspect of our platform. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to uh, once again, thank you very much to our panelists and uh, the participants for joining our session and for your um, attention. Yeah, I'm wishing you a nice day.